Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news, the 3rd of September 2017. Well, starting in the news this week is there's been a new massive data breach, this time totaling 711 million email addresses. So that's um, the largest to date. So this is news from Troy Hunt. So he was alerted to the presence of a spam list, a big one. And yes, it turns out to be the biggest uploaded to the website Have I Been Pwned to date. So you can check it out. Have you actually been pwned? Is your email address in the list? Well, you're probably receiving a lot of spam if it is. So not all these websites actually exist because uh, I've looked through the entries that we've received at work and yeah, they don't. There's been items like aa at um, company.com and aaa at company.com as well as something which said date in and the date was uh, 2012 and I can't remember the month off the top of my head but yeah these weren't the actual email addresses. So Troy does point out that not all of the emails are actually usable and it's, we've got things like rm set toll don't reply so yeah that's not going to be usable. There are some passwords included in the list, so all I can say is if your email does appear there, change your password. So we've got some lines that aren't properly formatted, yeah, and some entries that say sql.txt within the email, so yeah. This is the thing, we don't actually know where the breach has come from. I don't think it'll ever be known. I imagine it's being collected from various other breaches, as well as access into company mail servers. Certainly for the company I work at, it's roughly half the email addresses have been leaked. Mine is not in there. In fact, quite a lot of my colleagues aren't in there, although my manager is. Here's an article from Sans, an update on DVR malware, DVR torture chamber, digital video recorder. And this was to do with the Mirai outbreak. I know this may not seem particularly Linux related, but it's the Internet of Tat. These are actually Linux devices so running uh, running pretty poorly in terms of security. So what they have is a, uh, is it Telnet or SSH? But it has a, oh yeah, sorry, it's going to be SSH, and it has a standard password. So Dr. Johannes Ulrich did this test with uh, his vulnerable DVR device connected directly to the Internet with some prevention to disable any external attacks. He rebooted the device every five minutes and the reboot takes less than 30 seconds. Once exploited, the malware is not actually persistent. It does not survive a reboot. So started on the 24th of August and ended on the 26th of August. Just shy of two days it was running for. So total connections to DVR, 10,143. Total login attempts using the vulnerable XC3511 password. 1,254 different IPs every two minutes. So in short, every two minutes the system was compromised by someone or something logging in with the correct credentials. So this is what you can expect for the life expectancy of a vulnerable Internet of Tats device being connected onto the internet. Uh, two minutes before it's exploited. That is pretty shocking, really. So I'll leave a link to the article, but I'm not going to go any further into the detail. The FOSS Post has done an article on Prepare for Firefox 57 with these 10 web extensions, because Firefox 57 disabled a lot of add-ons and extensions. Yeah, looking at my list, um, <laughs> only one survived the upgrade. It's kind of improved now, I've got a couple more working, but okay, what do we have that actually work right now, or at time of printing, or at time of publishing, I should say. So, auto-delete cookies, dictionary, Google Translate anywhere, stylus, well, none of those I knew about, but next one I do know, so uBlock Origin has now been updated, this was not initially. Now I made some sort of remark as though I was not particularly in favour of uBlock Origin. What I should have expanded with is that I don't think uBlock Origin in its default mode runs particularly well with blacklisting. That blacklist is just too big and kind of slows things down too much. When you run it in whitelisting mode or third party blocking mode, it is actually quite effective. So I use it in whitelisting mode at work, 
and for my home computer, since I have no track, which is effectively blacklist on DNS server, I just use it to do cookie blocking, just to prevent the cookie pop-ups from showing on my system. So my block list is really small, literally, what is it? There's only about a dozen or so sites I think I actually go and prevent the cookie pop-ups from showing, because I whitelist cookies, and <laughs> that's where it gets annoying, because I cannot disable the pop-ups. Anyway, sorry, I spent a long time describing that, really. So, continuing on, we have Privacy Badger. I have used that before, but I mean, this is one of the add-ons you need to train and use for some period of time. Xnotifier, don't know, print, friendly, and PDF. IP address and domain information. <laughs> really? Why have we got that in the page? Uh, resurrect pages, shows a cached version when a website returns a 404 error, so page not found. And number 10, less pass, an alternative to last pass password manager. A few extensions that are still working. Linux Lite 3.6 final has been released. So what do we have? The Lite Sources software selector now allows you to select a repository closest to you. There's an online and offline search engine for the Linux Lite help manual. Very useful. And there's a couple of screenshots of the help manual. So yeah, Linux Lite, interesting distribution, kind of aimed more at new users really, but because uh, no, the variety of software and utilities included, it is suitable for a wider range of Linux users. Doesn't look like there's anything much else important, but we've got some theming changes, and uh, I think that's going to be slightly newer applications, but it is based on the Ubuntu 16.04 long-term support. From the KD Neon blog, it's now possible to get the new Falcon web browser as a snap. So Falcon web browser was formerly known as Coopzilla. I did try this out on my system, however, because I have a newer kernel, it would not work with snaps. So literally snaps will not work at all on my system. So I'm kind of stuck between being able to use the newer Ryzen CPU, but not being able to use snaps. Or otherwise, I would be able to use snaps, but not to get all the features from my Ryzen CPU. <laughs> Great, so what I may try and do is backport the version of SnapD from Ubuntu 17.10, which should work with a newer kernel. Or maybe I'll just try Ubuntu 17.10, sorry, Kubuntu 17.10, and see if I can add the Falcon web browser to that. But it's certainly quite an interesting concept to be able to use a web browser as a snap, because snaps do have sandboxing. And to be able to run a web browser with sandboxing is actually a very useful feature. This is going to be better than sandboxing provided in the likes of Chrome, which is more on a per tab basis. This will be for the entire application, it will be sandboxed. And incidentally, I have seen malware gain persistence in Chrome. Ubuntu 17.10, which is codenamed Artful Artvark, has reached Beta 1 milestone. And we have all the flavors participating in the beta one. However, not all of them have written the release notes, which is rather annoying. Well, it looks like there's no release notes for the Ubuntu beta one. Well, I know a couple of the features that we have an alternative to dash to dock to provide a dock for the Unity style layout of the desktop. And Wayland is a default display server. Actually, should Wayland be called a display server? Hmm, debatable. Anyway, you still have Xorg as a fallback. Although I have been informed that GNOME does work with NVIDIA in the Wayland Display Manager. There's some release notes on the Kubuntu release. So yes, using Plasma 5.10 desktop. Uh, so we've got 5.10.5, which is the latest release. KDE application 17.04.3. And some other notes. VLC now replaces Dragon Player as the default media player. Moon Package Manager is now shipped once again as an alternative to Plasma Discover. That's a funny contrast to KDE Neon, which ships Plasma Discover instead of Moon Package Manager. And the Katata replaces Amarok. I actually didn't know about that one, but why not use Clementine? Oh, I guess I'm going to have to take a look at Cantata. So that's Qt5 Music Player, which replaces the unmaintained KDE 4 based Amarok. The Ubuntu Budgie has some release notes, and this one's quite long-winded about the highlights, but is there anything specific? Um, Budgie Desktop 10.4, which I have seen in Solus, it does certainly look quite interesting, running very nicely, a bit of a different style than it was before, but no, nothing too vastly different. I mean, it had the control panel as a separate application instead of being in the Raven menu. 
Will all panels support transparency from the system theme? Yeah, this did seem to be of some improved effects on the transparency of Budgie. And finally, there's been some release notes for the Ubuntu Mate release, and uh, this one certainly looked quite interesting as well. I had a quick look through it about how the global menu and heads up display was working in Mate. Very nice, actually, <laughs> very nice indeed, I have to say. A little bit unstable though, so perhaps things have improved because that was a few days ago and it was still alpha release. Now we are in the beta. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we've got the global menu and yeah, I don't think there's anything much more than I've mentioned really. So <laughs> that kind of described the specifics in a couple of sentences. Yeah. From the register, Brazilians waxed Uni's Tor relay node booted after harvesting dot onions. <laughs> I like the headlines. A university research project in Brazil had its Tor Relay node banned after it was caught harvesting dot onion addresses of visitors. So a junior researcher was harvesting dot onion addresses in bulk and he states, My research in particular is about malicious hidden services. I'm developing a method to automatically categorise a malicious hidden service by its content, e.g. drug traffic, website, malware propagation, we would then publish an academic paper containing up-to-date statistics regarding what kind of malicious websites there are on the dark web. We were also going to develop a platform on which the user could verify a certain dot onion website is trustworthy or malicious before entering it. So it certainly sounds a very admirable efforts there. In fact, there are services that do that for the internet websites. <laughs> However, this is against the rules of Tor, and as a result, he was booted off. Well, sorry, not him specifically, but the university was booted off. And the researcher states he will continue his efforts, however it is going to be rather more difficult now. And for this week's stupid news, well I had to keep with Eclipse news once again because I only just spotted this article, but California Eclipse watchers treated after putting sunscreen on eyeballs Ooh, why would you do that? That's gotta hurt. <laughs> this might not have been the brightest idea anyone had during the eclipse. Several people in California have reportedly been treated this week after attempting to view the eclipse by putting sunscreen directly into their eyes. A nurse practitioner stated that we had seen a few customers who'd experienced pain after they put sunscreen in their eye since they did not have protective glasses. <laughs> Or floppy disks. No, no, some people have said floppy disks would not block the infrared light. Okay, fair enough. But uh, still looked good when I tried it before. So anyway. Um, so those were the only Eclipse-related injuries she had seen this week. And the <laughs> stupid people have uh, been referred to eye specialists. Poison Control says sunscreen in your eyes can be painful and should be rinsed out immediately. <laughs> Ah, some people, eh? Hmm. Well, that was a week of Linux news. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.